Is that wine? No, it's just water. Unless <laughs> Jesus were here, we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> okay, so uh, to start this episode off, I'm very, very excited and pretty nervous actually. Uh, I've always this is one of the main reasons then that I wanted to start this podcast uh, to talk about these certain topics, these very unique discussions that I feel like a lot of people have uh, these questions in the back of their head, especially now during a pandemic. I know that people turn to religion in times of hardship, so I you know decided that you know who better to talk about religion than a very good family friend who has been in. I think in almost all my parents' weddings, many, many weddings, and has been giving my family advice uh, through the years. We have an Anton on one with Father Johnny Go. Hi, Father. How are you doing? Hello, Anton. Good to be good. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. I know that you're uh, a very busy, busy man. But you know, just to start things off, how I know that you are one of the most tech savvy priests that I know. How has the this shift into this new normal been like for you? Uh, you know, you're, you're right because my previous job was uh, as a video editor. I trained as a video editor as a Jesuit. I was sent to Taipei for two years because oh, my apostolate oh. was supposed to be media, media production. No? But I ended up in Saver School, so now I'm in education. So it's been, it's been very valuable, the experience and the training I've had. In fact, a lot of my work this last summer has been training teachers to migrate to online. So... That has been a great resource, the experience of you know, um, video production and being involved in online media has been, you know, has been very helpful as well. I feel like now you can sort of, I, I don't know if, if you have this in the back of your head, me counting I told you so, because I know that you're one of the first people, I ingit ako because my brothers, my two older brothers studied in Savior, um, I only studied there for a year, so ako yung parang quote-unquote the one that got away. Before <laughs> my brother saw the light and moved to Ateneo, but then naingit ako kasi I would see Savior, um, very advanced na yung, like there was a time parang all the students had to have laptops or iPads, but sa technology was a like a huge part of the education comparing to the education style that I was experiencing in Ateneo. Basically, uh, when I was uh, head of Savior School, the main question I asked myself is if I were a student, how would I like to be educated? And obviously, technology is very much part of our lifestyle. No? When, when students get out of the school, they're very technologically advanced. There, there are so many devices. And then when they go to school, suddenly, they become a digital have-not. So apparently, it didn't make sense. And also, it didn't make sense that we weren't using technology to learn. So that was the reason why we decided to wade into that whole area of going, you know, going, going heavy on technology in the, in the school. I got to read an article online where you said that um, this is the you know this is the reality now. Everybody's in technology, and you said that if Jesus were to come here and become human in this day and age, he would be using the internet. He would be having like social media profiles and everything. Did you ever think of like what that would look like if Jesus had an Instagram, for example? Well, I haven't really imagined it, but I did say that some time ago. I remember uh, because the thing about Jesus, as you can see from the gospel, is that he's always looking for people. He's meeting them where they are. And today, I think you'll be ignoring the, the majority of people if you don't, if you're, you don't have an online presence. Yeah. So certainly, I think the incarnation, uh, God becoming human, will involve being online, I think. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to jump into it now. Um, one, of the, one of my big burning religious questions. Uh, so Jesus became human, meaning like he, he had to live like us, he died like us. Well, didn't die like us, because I wouldn't imagine like you know a big percentage of people dying that way. How should we look at it na Joseph and Mary didn't reproduce the normal human way if Jesus was supposed to be I mean Jesus is you know fully human, hundred percent human. Oh okay, so I'm trying to understand your question. So your question is that uh, why did he become human and go through being a baby first? Is that the question? Uh, no, so, well, how, come, how come Joseph and Mary didn't have to have sex for Jesus to, you know, come into the world? Like, why, why was it uh, a immaculate conception? Well, okay. So, I, I think the proper term for it is the virgin birth. Because, you know, Mary remained a virgin while giving birth, right? Immaculate conception refers to Mary herself 
that she was conceiving. I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My bad, my bad. That's no, what happened no, when you moved from Xavier School, Anton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you got me there. Yeah, so that's a great question. But the reason why the church has always thought that uh, Christ did not have a biological father, only a biological mother, is precisely because we believe that he is the son of God. And so he didn't need a biological father for that. It was the Holy Spirit right? that, that made Mary conceive. That's the reason behind it. Because if, if, um, if Jesus was born... Uh, the usual way, then people might say, oh, he, well, he's not really the son of God. He's also just like us. Oh, okay. So that's the reason behind it. So, because he was the son of God, that parang, by default, he can't, he's not exactly like us because may, may parang ibang quality na yung existence niya. Parang he didn't need to have a biological father. But if you ask me, it's also, it's, it's, it's quite possible that God may decide to go that way as well, right? mm-hmm. I mean, let's say God decides to send his only son to become human. It's also possible that he will do it the natural way, which is, yeah. you know, husband and wife. But it just, in our faith, we believe that that wasn't the way. That is the story. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that, that does make sense. Connected to that, right, we're taught that there's going to be a next coming, like, we prepare for Judgment Day when Jesus is going to come back again. Do you think that that's, that's ever going to be like a literal coming back? Or is it just is it a metaphor for when we die and then that's, that's the second coming, when we're going to meet him, you know, when our physical life ends? I think the answer to that is I do. Uh, it's possible that there will be an event, but it's also possible that it's something metaphorical, as you say. Mm-hmm. What's important is what it means. No? That when, when uh, that at the second coming of Jesus, we should be ready to meet him. Right? So it's possible that there'll be a huge event. And sometimes it feels that way, right? But part of things are going wrong and yeah. it's about to happen. No? But, but I'm not sure if that's how it's going to happen. The church does not say that that's exactly how it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And I think that's wise of the church not to explicitly claim that that's okay. the way it's going to happen. Because a lot of things, I mean, as humans, we also are taught that there are a lot of things that our human brains just can't comprehend. So I feel like we should just be okay with not knowing. Kasi, but sometimes, kasi, Father, I think that that could be like a lazy way out. And eh, you say, na, oh, it's something that the human brain doesn't have the capability of understanding. But at the same time, I think, like, how, why, why can't we... Why can't we try to like look for a logical answer to you know all these questions that we don't really have the answer to? Right, but I don't I don't quite agree that the human brain cannot understand. The human brain cannot understand completely, mm-hmm. but there are many things we can understand. So I think it's important for someone who believes to think and not to give up thinking. Like for example, in our in our faith, it's good to be a thinking Catholic because we're expected to believe not only with our emotions, but also with our, with our mind, right? yeah. We're supposed to believe in God fully, including our mind. So, so if you're not going to use your mind to sort of try to wrap your mind around something, even if you can't completely do it, parang your faith is not total. Yeah. Diba? So I, I think it, it's actually good that we are asking questions and we're trying to understand our faith. But we have to be humble enough to say, maybe we can't understand everything. But we should but try to understand. We should still, we the effort should still be there. Because that's something that I've been, I'm, so I'm 23 now, and I, I don't know if it's, like, if it's normal that in these years you really question. Mm-hmm. I do acknowledge that I am a Catholic because I was born in a Catholic family. I studied in a Catholic school. The, the people around me are Catholic. I also know that if for some reason my, my, my being was born in another country where you know, let's say Islam is the religion, then I would be totally Islam and, and you know, ha- have that. But then, as I sometimes think na it would have been okay if I didn't start asking these questions. Because like you said, right? we should be thinking Catholics. And we don't just accept all the teachings. Like, yeah, because sabi nila eh, sabi ng Bible, okay, I'm not gonna question it. Na. Sometimes, I kind of miss my younger self who kind of just accepted all of this because with all the questions coming in, parang walang, wala pa ako nakuhang answered. Medyo nawala yung parang, medyo bumaba yung inner peace ko because, because there's all these questions that are bombarding me that I didn't ask for, which I thought was a good thing. But then, now as a 22-year-old, 
I feel I feel pretty lost and I feel like I don't know parang what direction I should take. Yeah. Well, I, I completely get you. It's so much simpler and easier to be a, a kid because, you know, you don't have to, you, you have a sense of certainty. You mm-hmm. feel you're sure about things, no? Because things are so simple or seem so simple. But as we grow up, we realize that reality, the world, people are not as simple as we thought. God is not as simple as we thought also. No? So, it's, it's, so what happens is that we get a sense of uncertainty and with that comes discomfort. No? So we're not so sure anymore. But you know, that's why it's called faith. Eh? Faith is not the same as knowledge. Knowledge can say, if you know something, you're sure. Like gravity, is it gonna work if I if I get my mouse and let go of it? It's gonna drop. It's a nice mouse, by the way, Father. Can I just? Thank you. It's a nice Bluetooth <laughs> mouse. <laughs> so, or, or if you boil water at hundred degrees, it's certainly going mm-hmm. to boil. But when it comes to faith, you're not sure. So, uh, ambiguity and uncertainty is part of faith. Eh? So, so what you're experiencing is actually normal. But so you have to choose. What do you prefer? Do you prefer to have a false sense of certainty? but your views are simplistic, they don't quite represent reality? Or do you want to learn more about the world and God and yourself? But the, the trade-off there is you won't be so sure because yeah. life is complex, diba? Right? And God, yeah. of course, is a mystery, right? Yeah. I would... Like, the, the, the obvious answer, quote-unquote obvious answer would be, oh, oh, you should go... You know, you should take the path where you're going to question it or you're going to try to learn about it more. But... I guess it's because I just don't know yet. It's it's imagine like you're in a tunnel and then you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel and someone says the parang, Oh, there's this spot here in the tunnel where you can just chill. You're gonna be happy until you die. Or you can keep trying to go through that tunnel, but there's no certainty that you're gonna find some light at the end of the tunnel. So right now I'm at the I'm in a place na parang do I like cause it could be wasted effort then and uh you know, all these emotions and all the exhaustion that I'm, I'm getting from all these questions might not turn into like the peace that I'm looking for. So some, so I'm kind of getting enticed or like seduced to stay in the simplistic way of believing things. Because at the end of the day, if you end up, you know, you're happy and chill. Eddie, I would think that that's, a, that's like a better life than one that you're just so stressed and then there's no inner peace because there are all these questions. Right, right. And I think if, you know, there are many people who can be happy with just the simple faith, being sure, and, and their faith is simple, but you're not one of them, Antone. It doesn't look that way. So, <laughs> I, I mean, you can actually pretend, you can pretend to be like that, but you won't be at peace anyway. Because, you know, you, know you have that's questions. Right. Now, some people don't have those resources, eh? and they have simple faith, and that's enough, no? Parang ganon. But some of us, because of our education, because of our background, parang we, we ask questions naturally, we think naturally, and we, we have to be true to ourselves also. But, you know, so you have to, I think, undergo some kind of paradigm shift as well, that faith is not something, or peace is not something you possess. Eh? It's something you pursue. No? So it's, an, it's a constant effort. No? Like in the world, uh, ba? Parang, what is what is peace in the world? There, there are always problems, no? but yeah. you always try to pursue it. So I like your image of like running towards something. Ba? You, you know the saying, ba? sometimes the journey is more important than destination. destination yeah. What keeps you running is your faith. Because you're not sure there's a, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, but you'll keep running. That's where you're, you're exercising your faith in the process and your faith will become stronger, even if you don't have certainty. Did you have did you go through this when you were younger before you decided to you know become a priest and everything? Did you ever have like a phase where um for example you studied different religions or you or you questioned the validity of everything they talk about in the Bible? Did you ever go through a phase like that? Oh yeah, I did. Uh, in fact, what I did what I, what I did, in fact, was I lapsed as a Catholic. I stopped going to Mass for like three years. Oh. How, old, in, how old were you this time? I was in college. I was in college when, when, when that happened. And it, it wasn't because of any profound reason. I was just a month to go. And yeah. I just felt it was easier not to be moral and not to pay attention to the teachings. Of which, you know, I, I grew up in a, not in a very religious family, but I, I, I got a very good religious education in Saver School. And the Jesuits there were after me to become a priest. I mean, they, I was a good student, so they thought maybe you'll become a good priest. And I kind of got sick of that. 
you know, in my in my adolescent way, you know, I rebelled. So I just stopped going to mass and I started not to believe, no. And and so I, I w- when I do talk about these things, I do come up from a place where I've been there then. I've asked these questions and I've tried other alternative lifestyles, but at the end of the day, it's a question of the, the key word, I think, is judgment. You have to make a judgment. Uh, usually, like I say, when you're a kid, basically what happens is that we're being asked to accept religious facts. Right? Yeah. And then when we become adolescent, we become, we, we sort of say, hey, how come other people don't believe in this? How come some experts don't agree about this yeah. and that? And those so, people are intelligent, naman. they seem sensible. Right, naman. Right. And, and very good people, people yeah. of goodwill, also intelligent of, of goodwill. But how come they're not convinced that God exists or it's, that you should be a Catholic or whatever, right? So, parang religious facts become religious opinions. Okay. So, people begin to think, oh, I'm entitled to my own opinion. I believe in Islam. I don't believe in God. I believe in mm-hmm. Jesus, whatever. Equally, yan, bahala na kayo. So, that's the second phase of the journey. The mm-hmm. third phase is when you begin to think of your beliefs as a judgment. You have to say, okay, I've looked around, I've asked questions. Now it's time for me to make a judgment based on what the experts have said, based on my own experience. I have to make my own conclusion. And that's the responsible kind of believing. Yeah. So you, you can stay with facts, but it's not full faith. It's not total faith. It's the faith of a child. And that's good enough for God. That's true. But it's not good enough for some of us. Right? Mm-hmm. So we need to search. We need to ask questions. But unfortunately, many people stay with opinions. They think, okay, opinion, bahala na, whatever I want, whatever I feel like doing, that's it. But yeah. that's not most correct, diba? So we have to get to the point of being able to make judgments. Parang, uh, for example, to believe that I should, that the Eucharist is important, Mass is important, it has to become a judgment. It can't just be fact given to you, fed to you by your parents or teachers. It can't just be your opinion. It has to be a judgment you make. I feel like I'm still sort of in that. Um, in the religious opinion, still, parang, it's like I was just in this one small circle. We all went to mass on Sundays. We, it was you, you don't always. I do, sorry, I don't really listen to the mass a lot. Um, I'm selective. Like if the priest has a good homily, then I'm gonna listen. But there's a template of a homily that 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 sort of like when that happens by default, my ears are kind of gonna shut off. When they do the translation, they'll say one thing. They'll exactly say the next, the same thing in Filipino. Then they're gonna go to point D, and then they're gonna say the, they're gonna say the exact same thing in another language. And if you like, this is something that I read in grade school. Um, when it comes to like how you do your masses, uh, when you give your homilies, and I know that you're very comfortable in speaking and public speaking, how do you sort of keep that consistency that your homilies always? I don't, or maybe it's just my personal taste that it always hits. I always feel like it's not. Um, like they're not grade school CLE child, you know, religion sort of tone. Well, I, I don't know if my home is consistent, but I, I consistently use the same criterion I use in Savior. In other words, if I were one of the people in the pews, what would I want to hear? Mm-hmm. And I, I won't say anything that I don't feel. If if something is parang a cliche, parang if I say it during my homily it's going to sound like I'm bored. Mm. So it has to mean something to me. So that's my criterion. Uh, it Every has to time. Be yeah, because uh, otherwise it shows. Eh. Yeah. Um, it shows in my face the way I deliver it. I just hurry through it. I just rush through it. It has to mean something to me. Because preaching is a very personal business. Eh. And, and sometimes when I preach, I'm really preaching to myself. So many times... The things I say in the homily are things I need to tell myself or that okay. God's trying to tell me. That's why I think many people identify with it. Because it's not from like I'm preaching to you. It's more like I'm preaching to myself and I'm just sharing with you yeah. what I'm going through. I think people kind of like that. Yeah, because it's, it's more honest. I think people can tell when it's, uh, yeah, especially right, it's personal. Right. It's more authentic, I think. Because yeah, it's, it's coming from a place of searching also. It's not from a place of certainty. Na. I'm sure this is it. But parang, if, if the Lord said this, what could it mean? Parang it doesn't yeah. really make sense when you think, parang ganon, di ba? So people kind of are able to follow. I, I, that's my theory, anyway. You have been, Father, you've been a priest for how many years? Na po? Since 1998. So it's wow. been quite a while. For, so in all those years, the template of the, the Mass, the Mass, the Holy Mass, 
has been the same, you know, for all those years. I I am not a priest, so I feel like it's I don't know, people won't get offended if I say that I find the mask pretty boring. How do you like how do you keep because you don't I'm guessing you don't go to mass only on Sundays because you have to say the mass. So you're sort of the one of the main people that, you know, make the mass. Um do you ever get do you ever find some masses more boring than the others? Or how do you have like a certain way of how to make each mass, you know, special and different? Because it's like watching the same movie every time with like two plot twists that are different every time. But it's this pretty much the same story, you know, forever. Well, that's a that's a good question. Uh I, I, I think the honest the, the, the most honest answer I can give is of course there are masses where I feel bored and it's my own mass, huh? But I get bored in my own mass yeah. because you know it's it's um, masses are rituals, sir. So it, it's it there are patterns, but ritual has to have a path. It's like a da- you're a dancer, like right? So mm-hmm. there's a choreography, diba? So and and the thing here is that it involves the whole community. So the one of the benefits is that you go to another country, you don't know what the language is, but more or less you can follow the mass. Okay. So there's a kind of ritual, a kind of choreography, no? And so that's one the first thing I want to say. So. Of course, if you're doing it every day, or if you're attending one every Sunday, and your the, the the lead dancer is not doing a very good job, for example, yeah. of course people are gonna get bored, diba? Right? But at the same time, you also know that aside from the ritual, it's also a prayer. And in a prayer, okay. uh, what happens really is that we do our part, but God takes care of responding, diba? Right? And and yeah. responding to our prayer. So so it's a two-way thing. So sometimes we don't feel we're into something, but we're doing it because we we feel we want to do it for God. It's it's a it's our prayer to God. Parang ganon. And once in a while some masses become really engaging and moving. But most of the time masses are just quiet, ordinary events yeah. that can get boring. Right? Yeah. But the, the most most important thing there is that we know that during the mass, we're not the only one praying. The community is also praying with us, yeah. and God is there. We in a very special way. So it's an act of faith to go to mass, eh? and it's an act of faith to say mass every day. You know? I don't know about you, but you from from where you're sitting, you can see the priest by right? the altar. From where we are on the altar, we can see the people, and yeah. I'm gonna tell you that the people's faces aren't the most entertaining thing. Yeah, to watch. for sure. You know? I'm 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 people I'm a culprit. People are daydreaming, they're texting, you know. So it, it's very discouraging and also boring, diba? But yeah. it, it's an act of faith. You have to say, okay, you know, this is this is how it is. It is what it is. You do what you can and God will provide the rest. So it's an act of faith to to go to Mass, believing that God will give the graces even if we don't feel it. That's the hard part, eh, Because usually we want to to feel the grace, diba? Or the blessing yeah. of God. But many graces that God gives us are actually imperceptible, eh? And mm-hmm. most of the time, I think it's during the mass. So how do you sense? You said that it's a two-way thing. Right now, I mean, from my experience, I always felt like it's like, okay, you know, we're a bunch of people get together. They say the things. They sing the songs. Right? They do the sign of the cross and everything. But I don't know. How do you sort of unlock that? I feel like people like you or those who are like on a higher plane of I don't know, spirituality and faith, the the mass is more fun for them. Like it's there's more meaning. How do I get to that? Because people would say like, oh, you have to listen to what God says. I wasn't given the instructions on how to get to that higher plane. Because yeah, I would I would say the responses. I would sing the songs. Like I I would do I would do the checklist of like what you're supposed to do in mass. But it's still you know it's still the same mass that I've been going to. You know, ever since I was a little kid, like I felt like nothing has changed. Pa. Yeah. Well, I I think ano parang you're. We, we should try not to measure the mass in terms of what we get from it. I know that sounds strange, right? Because, uh, you know, we're supposed to receive the body of Christ, but also, aside from that, good reflections you know, about the scripture. And it's nice if we do. It's nice if we get some kind of a religious experience where we feel closer to God or we get some enlightenment during the mass. But what we get, kasi, is a blessing from God. And, and God... The mass is not a vendor machine where every time you put a coin, you insert a coin, you're gonna get what you want, you what you order. It's not like yeah. that. Eh? It's more like flying a kite. When you're flying a kite, you have to exert effort, but the wind has to blow. Mm-hmm. And if the wind doesn't blow, you can run all you want and, and get really tired, but it's not gonna take off. The kite's not gonna take flight. Right? But that's how it is in prayer. You know? In prayer, we put in the effort, but 
God will be the one to decide when and what to give us. No? Okay. So and we so, just gotta like be ready, just box out and just get ready. We just have to show up. Okay. We just have to show up. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times during retreats, that's also the mantra. Mm-hmm. Just show up. Like, for example, if the retreat director tells you, you pray three times a day for, let's say, 30 minutes or one hour each. Even if you're bored to tears, you're just sleeping, they tell us, just show up. Because you never know what God will decide to give you. Parang ganun sa misa. No? You're not guaranteed you're going to get something. Yeah. Once in a rare while, you'll receive a special grace or blessing. But just show up. It's an act of faith, eh, right? And in, in many ways, marriage is like that. No, I mean, it's just showing up for one another. Even if nothing much is going on or something boring is going on, you're still there. Yeah. So it's really more of a relationship. Eh? I wish I could give you a, a, a better answer. Like, no, if you do this, that's yeah. the magic formula. But, but that's, that's how it works. Eh? Life isn't like that. The mass isn't like that. Right? Yeah. We're not in perpetual high in life. Eh? Right? Parang usually it's ordinary, it's common, it's boring. Yeah. And then there are highlights and and the right? moments ups and downs, right? mm-hmm. Oh. Mm-hmm. Before we, I wanted to, I want to go to marriage. You 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 brought that up, but before that, this just last thing in the mass. Do you remember? Is there like a record in your head of how many masses you've said in a day? Like, what's the what's the most number of masses you've 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 said in a? Sorry, how do you say it? You said you celebrated, you hosted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think four maybe. Four. So but you, that's very, very and rare. okay um. I don't know if this is against the rules of future. I could cut this if ever. But do you drink the wine every in all those four times? But it's just yes, wine. you have to. You have to drink you the never, wine. You don't, did you ever you don't get? Okay. You don't have to fill it up, right? <laughs> did you ever get? Do you pick the wine, for example, or is there no, like no. just one supplier of all the That's, wine from the church? As far as I know, there's one supplier of very wow. sweet wine which I don't like. So there's no danger of me getting okay. carried away. So you've yeah. never, you've never like felt a buzz. While saying no. mass, it's even little. if it was for ah okay, so it's the it's oh, I get it. It's a babysit. I mean, yeah, you don't you don't fill it up. Yeah. Okay. Do, is there? Do you remember like what would stand out as like the weirdest experience you had while saying mass? Because for example, I had a couple of masses where, um, let's say I'm not agreeing with what the priest is saying or I don't really understand it. I always think to myself like, what's gonna happen if I stand up, raise my hand, and be like, Father, I have a question. And, you know, I mean, we're, we're in a day and age where everybody has their own opinion. But in all the masses I've gone to, that has never happened. Like, there was never any brave soul that just questioned, like, wait a minute. What, what is it that you're saying? I don't think it's like this. Do you, do you have any, like, weird experience like that? No, not during mass. Uh, people usually just, it's, I, I think it's part of the culture, no? Yeah. Uh, so in the Philippines, people don't really, don't really question the priest. And certainly not publicly, no? Uh, in fact, uh, I, I would, I, I've spent a number of months in San Francisco saying mass in a parish there, in a Jesuit parish. One Daming difference Pinoy. I, uh, Daming Pinoy. Daming Pinoy, but For I also sure. know that after the mass, in the Philippines, you say after the mass, they say, oh, I like your homily. Thank you for the homily. Nice homily. But there, they're very particular about what they like. They say, I like what you said about this. Or they will even ask a question, but not in a very, not in any disrespectful way. But you can tell that they're thinking about it and they're, they're willing to engage you in discussion, which is great, right? Dito, parang that, that doesn't really happen. Um, in retreats, I've had major weird questions. Like, oh, okay. um, so like, I remember, I, I always give a Holy Week retreat every year. That's my panata. Parang for me, it's the way I keep my, my soul. That's the way that's I your, say my, That's your like, spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. Right. Parang it helps me. It helps me uh, parang stay connected to, to the Holy Week by giving a retreat. So, so I've given a lot of retreats to big groups. And, and there would be occasions when, like during the open forum, uh, some people would really get obsessed with one particular, particular uh, question and keep asking that until they, they get an answer. Which of course they won't because I don't know the answer also. No? And, and one question that I that comes to mind is Judas. What happens to Judas? Ooh, what I have that question him? also. Diba? So parang for me, the answer is we don't know. Diba? But and and because one 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 exercise because I've given uh, pe- my listeners during a retreat is um, we believe that on Holy Saturday, uh, Jesus went down to the place of the dead. Diba? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's in the Apostles' Creed. We said, uh, he went to the oh, dead yeah, and then yeah. he rose again. So that so means he went, he went to, to hell, hell, right? 
well, hell there means the there was no hell yet at that time eh? because ah, okay. uh, before before Christ rose from the dead. Technical answer here. Uh, all the dead were just like par- parang in limbo, oh, and they called okay. it hell. So so Jesus went there, di ba? So of course, for me as a thinking Catholic and as a thinking priest, if Jesus went to the dead after he died, who would he meet there? He would meet Judas, right? Yeah. Among many other people. Oh yeah. Now what would he say to Judas? What? Oh, so, yeah. so it's a it's an exercise. What do you think will Jesus say to Judas? I think he I think he forgive him because I also I've also had this the conversation with my family that Judas hung himself. Not right. That that's. How- that's how he that's how he died. He hung himself. So I would imagine that there could have been like a second of um of repenting and yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's like that the there was a gospel recently. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm I'm using a gospel as an example. The the vineyard parable, parable of the vineyard, where if you work from six AM to twelve midnight, you get paid the same as the person who works at eleven fifty nine PM to twelve midnight. That one minute, Pion, that's enough. That's the ticket. You're in heaven. So I would also like to believe. Also because I don't want to imagine that anybody is experiencing eternal damnation. That's so unanaman. Like if you are alive for eighty years and you've spent eighty years doing like really bad stuff in the world, thus you're gonna have eternity of just my oh, for me, just my belief it's like, okay, maybe give him eighty years of torture, but then Eternity, you know, eternity just doesn't. Um... No, but, but you're right. Uh, but but what's interesting about that is that some people are are shocked by that, by the possibility that Jesus would forgive him, and I find that very interesting. Like I, I've had people say, uh, "How can you suggest that?" It's, which I never say Jesus forgave him. I said we yeah. don't know. But if I were to imagine it, I would probably think he would he would embrace him. No. Yeah. Uh, in fact, other spirituality writers he would even, kiss him. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, exactly. He would kiss him. Some spirituality authors have said that. So it's a very moving scene. We don't know for sure. I always tell them, you got to interview Jesus when you die and ask him what happened. Oh, yeah. but, but basically, uh, I think it's possible. No? In fact, for me, it's likely. But I don't know. Yeah. But what's interesting is that so many people are so against that possibility. I find that so interesting. Yeah, and it's, it's pretty- like the parable you oh. mentioned. Like people, the, the people who started working first were upset. Yeah. Right? Going back, you mentioned marriage. I want to just touch on this um, kind of quickly. Uh, for, for example, Father, is there a sport that you like to play? I used to get nosebleeds all the time. So I never, I wanted to play basketball, but I never got good at it because I would get a nosebleed all the time. So oh, I man. ended up swimming. But now oh, I thought I'm, you said, I thought you were going to say, so I ended up becoming a priest because I kept getting no, those no. Swimming. I, I swimming. And then, but lately I've been, I've been biking and the whole time I was in Xavier, I was into boxing. Oh, wow. Uh, That's and then, uh, a boxing priest. Well, I'm sorry. I, I feel like people also, people always kind of put priests in these boxes that they can't like do these stuff. Like if I I'm see a, training. it's not yeah, for, we never I, sparred. Obviously I'll, I'll, I'll probably, be defeated like crazy, but, but it's just like, for it to fit. Uh, okay, I feel like I feel like you would have an advantage though. I don't know, just like if I would have to, you know, bet on uh, someone like two people fighting, one of them is a priest. Like, ah, oh, that person's probably like more confident because, like, I don't okay. know, I guess a priest would be like more like God is with me, but anyway, that's not the point. Um, for example, swimming. Normally, if you want to be the best swimmer in the world, you're going to ask advice from, you know, professional swimmers, people who want Olympic medals and people who, you know, have really you know, um, done that experience and studied what swimming is. But when it comes to marriage, a lot of times, um, a lot of priests are marriage counselors and they, you know, they, they listen to the problems of the couples, they give advice, but that just doesn't really make sense for me because priests never got, I mean, at least, I guess, I guess 99% of priests never got married. So, like, how come priests get to sort of give advice on an experience that they haven't done? Yeah, well, there are two kinds of experiences. Eh? Merong direct personal experience. Merong being vicarious experience, diba? And And I think... Well, first of all, I don't like giving advice. Uh, for me, that's not the way to do things, especially today. Maybe before in the olden times, advice is what people look for. No? But now, sorry, how, not, what's olden times? Like, is that how would you maybe describe it? 70s? 80s? Oh, maybe okay. 70s, 70s, oh, that's, you know, not, you know? so that's, like, that's like this lifetime. Like People are still alive from that olden right, right. times. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. I anyway. Going, I was born in the 60s. So 
parang when when people were less were more how do you say deferent to authority advice was something that people took seriously but today sometimes when you give advice people get turned off diba yeah. people are very protective about their right to choose and right to make decisions so i'm very mindful of that and some and i think our job as priests is just to help clarify things just to give just to give feedback to a person or a couple like you, you said this a while ago it sounds like this parang ganon and if you say this what do you think the other person feels but it's more facilitative mm, okay i get else, it diba? but it, it also does, at the yeah. same time, but at the same time i just want to say that i've talked to a lot of uh, married couples and and so i've learned a lot also along the way so without claiming to be an expert because i never went through it myself obviously uh i i do have a lot of wisdom from from listening to people and from learning from them i've learned a lot from married couples no i, I mean people have different strategies in getting in staying married mm-hmm. i've learned from the mistakes of, of couples as well so but i draw from that but okay. i never claim to be an expert because obviously i've never been married yeah but you've been in have you been in relationships like in college and stuff i wouldn't be shocked yes yeah, yes i i, I yeah. think i yeah because i entered when i was already 26 so at that time many oh. people were entering early on so yeah. I, i entered 26 so by that time i've had so it, the way i put it is that when i said no to the world i knew what i was saying no to yeah because i this with some of my other companions entered rather early so they did not go through that i also worked for four years so i i knew what it was like to 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 make a livelihood you know yes so yes. All, all that i think it's important it defines my priesthood as well uh-huh. Uh-huh. okay i didn't have that opinion that yung uh, i guess priests are in the position where a lot of couples would go to them for this advice so the fact that the let's say priest a parish priest has listened to so much like problems from different couples so even if that person has never um that priest has never had actual marriage experience like he knows a lot of stuff so he can okay so in that sense i would get it why a priest would can i just um, add on that some, yes. it's, it's a lot of it's the tone also eh, right because if you're very prescriptive and some priests are like that right? that you have to do this you can't do that pag ganun medyo medyo mahirap yon right? because you, you've never been through it eh. and i know for a fact for example when i when i listen to married couples that it's so difficult to be married and it's so difficult to be a parent like now i have a pet parrot <laughs> and already i'm like it's driving me crazy it's high maintenance it has its own personality i'm thinking kung anak ko to parang hindi mo di ba parang i think it's really harder harder to have a kid than a parrot or complicated di ba so you can't keep a kid in a cage a lot of people get that. <laughs> that's true but that's with true. the with the parrot that, how, are there words that your parrot can say like can he say i am peace be with you for example or Well, I, I wish it could say something pious, but all it's managed to do is say Nacho, which is its name. Okay. Hello and come on. Oh, so, okay. Only two years old. Right? Only two years old. So bata pa naman. That's. I'm very careful around it because I don't want it to pick up some bad words. Okay. So, <laughs> of course. Next up, this one. Um, quickly, gang also more on like my, my grade school questions. In the Bible. We don't know what happened to Jesus while he was a teenager and while he was like a young adult. There was there's that big gap. How do you, how, in your experience, how do you sort of um, reconcile that there's this big gap? Like, we don't know. Jesus could have had a girlfriend. Jesus could have, you know, gone to other countries and became a dancer, for example. Not was wasn't always a carpenter. What is your like, opinion when it comes to that the kabataan days of Jesus? Uh, it's funny because I never really wondered exactly what he did. Uh, parang I didn't really, but it wasn't that important to me. Parang ganon. Parang for me, the most important thing is that he went through human development the way we did. Okay. So parang everything that goes with it. Because sometimes people think Jesus is is God in a human costume. No, parang parang nag nag ano niya nag charade lang parang ganon. Parang he just pretended to be human, but actually he became a baby, and went through the whole thing. So, uh, what I've imagined Jesus to have gone through is all the struggles and all the questions and all the uncertainties that adolescents go through. Yeah. But the the main thing about Christianity is that God is no stranger to what we go through, eh? because He's been through through it all. So yeah. those hidden years of Christ, not so much what did He do, what His hobby was, but it's more what were His 
parang experiences, his struggles, di ba? And, yeah. and my answer to that is probably similar to ours. He was probably confused okay. about himself. He was probably trying to find out who he was. Yeah. He was trying to make friends, you know, and he was trying to, uh, you know, get along with his parents and so on and so forth. So, so parang for me, that's, parang that was enough for me. It's not so much like, did he go to okay. Egypt or what? And I wasn't really, for some reason, I wasn't curious about that. I was more curious about what kind of struggles did he go through that, yeah. that, so that he understands what I went through when I was an adolescent. Diba? Parang ganon. I, Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, I think the, the, the moment that question came into my head, I feel like I was around that age. And uh, I, Shep, I wanted to know, like, oh, if Jesus, if Jesus were my age, let's say I was 13 that time, parang, how come I don't see, I don't hear any stories about it? But it, going back, I feel like it's kind of messed up if he was like, I think that Jesus should have had some, like, he knew that he was God. He knew he was God's son coming in. Because imagine if you tell any human baby diba? that you're the son of God but if they're fully human if we say that he's fully human imagine a human that you tell him oh you're supposed to like save the entire you know human race I think that's pretty messed up and like kind of kawawa and so much pressure that you put but on one single did person you know, you know that he was God sorry sorry sure? no I'm did thinking I, I was just saying like I, I think he had to know or else he would have gone insane like j- just because humans can't take, I don't know, like it's, I mean, that's happened that humans aren't supposed to take that much, you know, hold that but much who pressure. Knew that he and... was God? I mean, I don't, think Mary knew, I don't think Mary knew he was God either. Was Mary, Mary told? Knew. Like, she was Gabriel. told. She, yeah, she was told that she was going to bear the son of the Most High. But what does that mean, Diva? We don't know what it means. It can mean <laughs> you'll be a prophet, you'll be a. Messiah, we don't know what it means. Right? All, we, all she knew is that it's somebody important and we don't know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So she wasn't sure either. She was trying to figure things out even under the cross. Uh, I think she was also surprised by what, how things turned out. Yeah. So I, again, I'm talking sure. about certainty and faith, right? now, they're, not, they're not the same. Faith doesn't mean you're sure. Faith means you're not sure, but you're going to keep doing what you need to do. That's what faith is, right? Okay. Okay. Ah, that's then. That's. I think that would be like the the disparity between when I see people who are super faithful and like sure of, for example, you, for example, um, brother Bo Sanchez. I I kind of envy like, wow, these people just kind of got it now. Like, yeah, they went through like so many years of questioning and stuff, but I felt like, oh, they're in a point that they probably get it now, and they think it's like hundred percent fact. But so you're telling me that that doesn't mean that you know the 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 leaders, the people who preach about Jesus, they still have their, I guess, moments that parang, wait a minute, is all of this true? Yeah, and I think, I think that's healthy because every time you have doubts and questions, you're being invited to strengthen your faith. For example, let's say I have a question that bugs me about Jesus. I can't think of anything right now, uh, but uh, let's, say, let's, let's say you read Da Vinci Code and you're wondering, oh my gosh, did that happen? But you have to make a decision. Are you going to believe it or not? Diba? So if you say, oh, it's, it's, you know, I met, I met Dan Brown, actually, and he was very clear. It's a, it's a fiction. It's a novel. He was very clear to us. No? And he was very happy. Yeah, he was very happy when he found out that I like his novel and I'm a Jesuit And you're a priest. Yeah, and I said, but, but it's, a, it's fiction, right? You don't believe it, do you? And he goes, yeah, it's fiction. But a lot of people didn't get that. Diba? But like when I read it, I got disturbed because it, he, it was written so well. Diba? Yeah. But at the end of the day, I said, nah, I don't believe this. I'm sticking to my faith, right? So yeah. you're exercising your faith. You're making a judgment, right? mm. You're saying, okay, I've heard this, but it's fiction. It doesn't okay. touch my faith, no? Parang ganon. And, and that's when our faith grows, eh? when, when we meet, uh, when we encounter moments of uncertainties. Now a, a big um, topic that I think has, has caused a lot of um, arguments and conflict in the Catholic society. What is your take on homosexuality? Because you know, I, there's so many, there's so much about it. But then like, when when you are asked about, I'm pretty sure people have come up to you and like talked to you about this. What is your take on homosexuality? People say it's against the Bible, but then people say no, God loves everyone. It's not a sin to be gay. So what is your take on all of that? I, I'll take my cue from Pope Francis. Now, when he, as you know, when he was asked about that, he very famously said they deserve our compassion and understanding. So that's the first, that's the first thing that needs to be said. 
the second thing I want to say is I was a psych major uh, in college, yes. no? and uh, I think psychology knows a lot more about homosexuality today compared to biblical times, right? Of course. Uh, one of the, <laughs> That's enough. a lot of years wasted if we yeah. don't know anything new. Because if, you, if, you, if you appeal to the Bible period, uh, parang that's problematic because we know so much more about the yeah. human person homosexuality. We're a new human. We're a different human now from the ones two thousand years ago. And 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 the, I think the main the main thing that psychology tells us is that whether it's um, nature or nurture that causes homosexuality, whether it's your genes or environment, that's still the jury's still out there. We don't know yeah, yet. No? Yeah. But whatever it is, what seems clear is that. Uh, the real homosexuals have no choice, right? It's not a choice they made. Yeah. They don't have there a are choice. people who who tried to, you know, try to love a girl, you know, like they, they could even have kids, for example, but yeah, at the end of the day, they're right, homosexuals. Right. And I've talked to a lot of, a lot of uh, cases also, a lot of people. So I also know a lot of things about it because of the experiences of people. So for me, the fact that a person doesn't have a choice it's a very important idea. So if, mm-hmm. if God, for example, because if you, if you choose to be different or problematic or whatever, I'm not saying homosexuality is a problem, but if you decide to, if you have a choice, may to be responsibility, but if you don't have yeah. a choice, um, we have to think about it a bit more carefully before we rush into any condemnations, I think. Yeah. So for me, the, the, first, the, the first note that should be struck it's a note of sympathy and compassion. Yeah. But, but it's, it's, it's tough to put it there. Now, okay, we'll be, you sympathize with them. You'll be okay with them. Because what I learned also in my Theo class in Ateneo is that this is this. I, I, I was like, okay, come on, church. This, this is such a, I felt like it was a bailout. They said, being homosexual is not a sin, but doing homosexual acts is a sin. So at the end of the day, like, you're not fooling anyone. I mean, at least, I mean, I, I didn't buy it. Like, how can you tell me that it's not a sin so long as you don't do anything about it? Right? It's like, imagine that they say, um, it, you're, you're allowed to go on the trampoline, but you're not allowed to move. Parang, come on. Like, that's part of, I, I guess it's part of it. So, well, am I, is there another way to interpret that message or understand what the church is standing that, it's okay to be homosexual so long as you don't do anything homosexual. Yeah, I, I think that's a problematic formulation. I think that was a formulation that they tried to throw out there and uh, hoping it would work. But now I think a lot of people think that's problematic. It's not, you, you're, you're telling, you're still telling the homosexual there's something wrong with the person. If you tell yeah. the homosexual, he, he or she cannot practice it. Right? So I think there's an acknowledgement that it's a limited statement. So we still need to figure out what's the best way to formulate it. But what I want to say also is very much part of the tradition of the church is the sanctity of conscience. Okay. And that, that, that trumps everything. Eh? In morality, kasi, you know, it's not advertised too much because some people will abuse and say, that's my conscience. I don't want to kill people. That's my conscience. Or I want to do this. That's my conscience. Right? So, so parang for me, uh, iba yung official statement sa pastoral situation so when Sorry, I'm could pre- you explain that? What is that? Okay. Like when I'm preaching in public, okay. uh, you're talking to the public. You don't know who's listening. So yes. you have to be very careful about your words. You have to err That's on the right. side of the bottom. But if you're talking to one person, like in, the, in confession, for example, or in counseling, you can understand the person a bit more. There's greater mm. leeway. You know? <clears throat> okay. And, and at the end of the day, it's the conscience that's important. No? The conscience of the person. For example, if a person told you... Um, that, that he is, for example, a homosexual, no? and he is promiscuous. I think whether you're straight or gay, if you're that's, promiscuous, there you go. that's a problem, right? But if, if a person comes to you and says, um, I'm gay and I'm in a, a, you know, a, a permanent relationship, I'm trying to, in a committed relationship, that's a bit grayer. Yeah. So I, I, would, I would hesitate in condemning such a thing. No? Yeah. Uh, so, so you have to journey with the person, walk with the person, and try to figure out you know, if it's actually something that you have to guess whether the Lord will mind yeah. or not. Yeah. Okay. Well, like, that makes sense. Because like, if it's, of course, if it's what they told uh, to taught us in Theo, that's sort of like a public message. Like, example, if someone, if if I would say, if say you, Father, you would say, I love boxing, 
but then that's all we say. I love boxing, but you're doing it because you you know you want to be fit. Like it's a fun activity. Some people could take it like, oh, Father Johnny Go likes beating people up. Like there could I get that there could be that you can uh-huh. misunderstand it. So it has to be like a it has to be like given in a semi foolproof way so that right, right. to minimize all those misunderstandings. And you know, in social media, that's what happens. Yes. Everything is simplified, right? Everything is sound bites and info nuggets and taken out of context. So and people just react. So it's it's a dangerous arena in a sense. So you have to be very careful about what we what we we have to be very careful about what we say. Yeah. For example, Pope Francis keeps getting uh, problems from the very conservative Catholics because they all, they're always so scared that you know that he's saying things that might be dangerous. Yeah. Around, but. Uh, he hasn't been, no? Yeah. And th- times are really changing now. And probably la- last thing that we could talk about before you go prepare for Mass is that um, the existence of different religions. This is a very heavy topic that's also really like burning in the back of my head. There are a lot of religions and we're taught that you respect other religions. You don't say that religion is wrong or that you know their belief of what the higher existence is isn't right. But then, if you are to believe the Catholic faith that there's only one God, you know, and he had a son named Jesus and this whole narrative, if you were to believe that was true, then you sort of have to, you know, not believe the others and think the others are wrong. So how do you find the balance in respecting other religions but at the same time, you know, if you really truly believe, believe in your religion, then that means you don't think the other religions are true. Well, it's like this. Um, it, it's one thing to say that you respect other religions. It's another to th- it's another thing to say that they're all equally correct, mm-hmm. right? Now, I think we will be hypocritical if we don't say that every religion or most religions are making a claim about reality. For example, you said for Christians, there's only one God and Jesus is the Son of God. That's a claim in reality that the other religions don't accept. So either you're right or they're right, yeah. right? So, so at the end of the day, I think what the, the, the best uh, way to maybe uh, capture what, how I feel about this whole thing is that we, apparently it's the difference between pluralism and relativism. No? Pluralism means there are different views. You have to be respectful and you have to be open to learn from them. We can learn from Islam. We can learn from Buddhism. Yes. We can learn from all religions. Diba? But at the end of the day, uh, then we cannot say they're all equally correct. No? Because for, if, you're, if you're a Christian, you're making a claim about reality and it's, you're, you're being an intellectual phony if you're going to say we're all equally the same. Because it doesn't make sense, right? Because mm-hmm. say if you're making a claim that the only way, for example, to God is Jesus, yeah. so you have to at least say that in your judgment, we're going back to that word, no? in your judgment, based on your best lights, this is the better way without condemning the others, without saying they're wrong. There are good things about them, but as far as you can tell, this is the better way. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's being honest. Because for you to dilute your own religion just so you can hold hands with everyone, that's not being authentic either. You're pretending, that, you're, you're pretending to, believe, to not believe something you actually believe. Right? Yeah. And I think that's fair because... If they say that about your religion, you should also accept that because that's their judgment. Right? For example, if a Muslim says for, for him, Jesus is only a prophet, not the son of God, and there's only Allah, then you, you respect him and you also respect his judgment that you're wrong, that he's right. right? But there's a possibility. And there's nothing wrong with that. You have to agree to disagree, right? Yeah. But at the end of the day, our job is to make a judgment for ourselves. But we, we're not going to force other people. But if they ask us, we have to be honest and say, like, like me, obviously, I'm kind of biased, right? I'm a, I'm a Catholic priest. Yeah. So obviously, <laughs> Man, I'm Catholic, that. <laughs> well, maybe content, right? But I think it's something that we should parang wear, wear with honor because that's, that's, that's being true to yourself. And yeah. I think we, we, we should be respectful of others also. If they say the same thing about us, that they think their religion is correct and ours is wrong, then okay, that's their judgment. I guess we'll find out in the end, right? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, but, but, but that's all that's asked of us. Eh? Given our best lights, what is our best possible judgment? Right? Yes. Looking at all the people we know, talking to people, 
we have to make a judgment. And when you think about it, that's the purpose of our, our spiritual life, eh? to come to a judgment and to be committed to that. And it's always a process. Like even for me now, I'm more or less set, right? It's a little too late for me to change my yeah. mind, right? But I've kind of invested a lot already. But I've also learned a lot <laughs> along the way. Parang things have been confirmed, man. But even now, I'm still open to learning from other people. And is it possible that one day, I'll find, I'll, I'll, parang something will happen, and I'll find out that, oops, parang mali yata ako. I think I should be open to that in principle, di ba? Yeah. But it doesn't mean I'm not committed to my faith now, because being 100% certain is a myth. And people, I think people should throw that out the window. If you're going to, if you're going to insist that you want to be 100% sure, you're going, you're not going to be good to yourself. You're going to be very hard on other people as well. We should be humble that we don't know everything, and that we're always trying to find God. No? We're always trying to look for God. We never possess God. We're always in pursuit of Him. No? That's why I like the word follow or following God. We're always one step behind God. It's hard to keep up with God because God's always greater. So, parang for me, we cannot pretend that we already possess the absolute truth. Although sometimes, some of us sound that way. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. So much wisdom. And I really thank, thank you very much, Father. And I, I, I was really looking forward to this. Bitin nga ako. Hopefully, we could do this again sometime soon. Um, I know you have mass that you have to uh, prepare for and a great homily that you're going to say. So, thank you. Thank you very much again, Father, for your time and your wisdom and all your answers and for guesting on my show. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. I had a great time. Thank you very much. Bye.